Welcome to Ask the Expert. I'm Ross Brand. This is the show where we take your questions for our guest expert. And our expert today is Tim McDonald. He knows all about building relationships, building community and social good. And we'd love to get your questions on. Ask the Expert is brought to you by Livestream Universe. And every weekday, you can go to LivestreamUniverse.com slash updates and find out what to watch, what's going on in live streaming and digital broadcasting. And uh, we'll also tell you that on Monday, we got a great guest for you, Vincent Orlick, uh, the owner of the Blabaholics Group. He also does uh, commentary on TV in Phoenix about social media and news and sports. Um, <clears throat> he's going to be my guest on Livestream Stars Monday, 7 p.m., uh, right here on Fire Talk. So, Tim, it's great to see you. Um, I've I've told you this before. I'm going to share. I, I mentioned in the update. I I got to to know who you were when I first got on Twitter, and I was seeing all these people who had big followings, right? And I noticed that most of them didn't follow people back and didn't really do anything to respond or interact with people. They just basically had a PR feed going. Look at me. I'm so great. This is what I'm doing. This is what I did. This is what we're doing tomorrow. This is what you can buy, right? And then I see Tim, and he's got this big following, and he's actually having conversations with people. He actually follows people who don't have a thousand or two thousand or ten thousand followers back. He actually shares what people do when they do something interesting. That he's not just looking at how can this help me, but how can he engage with people? And I said, wait, this guy gets it. This Twitter thing isn't just a place where celebrities go and, you know, people who are influencers go to just tell you the same story that they tell you on their corporate press release or website. This is actually a place where people are having interesting conversations and sharing things. And you get to know and meet new people through things that people like Tim are, are sharing. So, that's how I got to know Tim. So he, from the from the first time I saw him, before I even met him in person, he's always been all about building community. Um, Tim was at Huffington Post. He was the director of community there. Um, he was doing live streaming before we called it live streaming, right? You were doing uh, I mean, my you guys community. Remember Justin Hangout TV and, and like you know, I mean, when <laughs> Huffington Post live. I mean, it was like I'm, I'm going back in the day when like you know. Um, you know, you stream and, and, um, oh, I'm trying to remember some of, I, I keep forgetting some of the other ones, but it's like, you know, those were like, you know, that was live streaming. Like when you actually had to make sure that you had a really good, you know, wired connection <laughs> and, uh, and it wasn't on your mobile device. I mean, think about, you know, recording on your mobile device was like not even in our thought process. It was just, you know, the little GoPros and, and, you know, getting our video cameras mm -hmm. on our, on our laptops. And, and that's, that's really what launched me into working at Huffington Post was um, starting my community manager and, using Google Hangouts as a way to bring people together every week um, that were wanting to learn about community management. Because back when I started it, there it wasn't as prevalent as it is now. And so, you know, really live stream video has been the way that I've, you know, I got my job at Huffington Post. It's been, you know, and I haven't been doing it as much lately, but I still do it in a lot of, I mean, I have more of these types of calls than I actually have these kind of calls on the telephone. And, and right, because I right. do feel it's the purest form of communication we can get outside of meeting in person, flesh to flesh. Now, when you got to um, when you got to Huffington Post, um, were they doing any any live video chats or anything like that before you got there? Or were you the, f the first one there? Yeah, who well, was, I, who was I mean, I can't it. take the credit for me personally, but um <laughs> I'm happy and, to um, when I got there, we were getting ready to launch HuffPost Live. I was, I think, one of about the first 15 or 20 people that they hired when they were when they were building the team for HuffPost Live. And um, what we would do, because I was also running a, a show called um, Coffee Time Chat on Spreecast, which actually just just ceased operations not that long ago. And um, and so what we would do is we would actually, before we launched HuffPost Live, is we would start prepping our, our producers, our host, and some guests and bring them into a spreecast 
And we didn't call it HuffPost Live. Hmm. We just called it a live, you know, HuffPost Live conversation. And it was amazing some of the views that we got. Um, HuffPost Live launched actually in time for the last presidential election that we went through. And so, so, um, so it was, you know, right about this time of year, um, where we launched and it was gearing up with, with all the, the politics and the conventions and, and speeches and debates. And, and we had all these things happening. And, and so we did do it, um, using Spreecast. And then when we went to, into the studio, when the studio was finished and we actually started doing pre-production, uh, shows and then we went live and, and released it to the world. That was all using Google Hangouts, but it was using Google Hangouts in a very different way right. than most people use it. We had a professional studio. Um, we took all the video feeds and and ran them through. You know, we had a video team that that took those feeds and actually put it through and edited them out and put our own frames on it and everything else. So it looked like you were actually on a live, you know, um, you know, professional video camera, even though you were just coming in through a Google Hangout. And, um, and that was really the first. And then once we started going into production and started growing and seeing the, the response that we were getting, um, things that I'm seeing people jump on now that Blab's gone, like uh, you now, um, HuffPost was, was forming partnerships and, and doing stuff with you now influencers back when you now first launched. And, and that was, so that was like three years ago, at least. And it just, it's, it's like, you know, and what they're doing now. And I think, you know, so many other media organizations are doing like with Facebook live and, and using that. Um, It's just amazing to see, you know, kind of where live streaming has gone in traditional media outlets. It's incredible to see the growth in just the the last four years. Yeah. I mean, and, and Twitter just cut a deal with CBS news the other day, uh, or at least it was, I just saw, saw something about it the other day where they're going to political conventions from CBS news's coverage, um, on Twitter. So if you're on the go and you know, you can open up your Twitter app and <laughs> you can get the, the, the party line from you you know know one of the parties, you know, what's wherever so you are is like when we launched up post live, we actually, we live streamed the debates um, between the Republican and Democratic, you know, nominees. And, you know, so it was after their conventions, but it was before the election. And we actually live streamed the debates that went on. And they were some of the, I mean, it was right after we launched and they were, when, when AOL featured us on, on the AOL site, it was absolutely insane. The amount of traffic and the amount of comments that we had going on. And you were actually able to watch HuffPost live on your mobile phone. So what I'm, you know, and we did have the commenting going on. So what I'm seeing Twitter announce is, I think people were doing this well before Twitter started making a big deal about it. We've been doing this for like, you know, eight, nine years, you know, and Twitter's just finally catching up to what, how people are using it. Right, right. Um, so when you were doing community management at, at, at Huffington Post, um, I don't think before I saw you doing that, I don't even think I knew what the term that the term existed. I don't even think I knew what it was. And then I saw um, tell everybody kind of how you got into community management and how you yeah, how you well, define um, it. Quite simply, I got into community management because I was um, involved in real estate in the Chicago area. And I, I just gotten fascinated with social media as a way to find potential clients and and expand a network of, of people because I was pretty, even though I grew up in the area, um, I, you know, I had moved away for so many years and I had come back and my kids were grown at that time. And I was just like, how am I going to, you know, meet people? I, you know, most of the time you do it through school, through church, you know, through, you know, organizations and, and right. sporting events. And, and I wasn't doing any of those things. So I'm like, how am I going to, you know, connect with people? So I found Twitter and, and I, I, so one of my friends that I met on Twitter actually told me about Social Media Club Chicago. And I said, well, geez, I'd love to go to one of those events. And so I went with him to my first event. Um, he volunteered. And so I said, well, wait, I want to get involved. How do I volunteer? And I, I signed up to volunteer. Um, I, I helped out a lot. And then they asked all the volunteers if anybody was interested in joining a communications committee. So I, I raised my hand. I was the first one, or I was one out of 15 people on the first call. I was one out of three people on the second call. And I was the only person left after the third call. And so I basically became the 
communications committee at, at, at Social Media Club Chicago. And I did everything from running the Twitter account to, you know, email marketing to customer service to event coordination to, you know, making sure everybody was taken care of when they came at the event to helping connect people once they were at the event, um, welcoming new people in, introducing them to people I think they'd find interesting. And, you know, then I started hearing this word called community manager, and I wasn't sure what it was. So I started doing some searching around and I found there was some gaming community managers. They've been around for a long time. Um, much different than I think how most of us consider community managers, but we, I still learned a lot from them. Um, there was some in the, um, startup world, you know, where, where you were like one of three hires at the, at the startup and, and you just did like everything. And so they didn't know what to call you. So they called you a community manager because you basically were doing everything. And, and then there was another, um, kind of group that was at the community round table, which was really focused on enterprise community management, which was, you know, internal communities for large organizations. And so, you know, I wasn't really finding what I what I wanted. And that that's what led me to actually start my community manager is because I was figuring if I was looking for this information that people couldn't get, probably other people were too. So why don't I start up my community manager and have it be a community you know, of community managers for community managers where we all just kind of could help each other. And, and so the simple term of how I view a community manager is you are a conduit of information. You are the voice of the organization to, to the community and you're the voice of the community to the organization. And so this, this holds true, whether we're talking about a gaming community, whether we're talking about an internal community, whether we're talking about community in a marketing aspect, in a, in a customer service aspect, it can be any one of those things, or it even can be in person, right? It doesn't even have to be online. It can be in person, but you are, you have to be able to translate the information of what your community says, because they talk a different language than the people in your organization talk. And so you need to be the one right, who conveys right. what the company wants in the language that the community not only understands, but th they're going to be receptive to. And then you need to take what the community says, turn that into language that your organization understands and, and tell them how they feel. And so you really need to play this very um, neutral role of definitely knowing that you work for the organization and that's where your paycheck comes from. But that if you're not representing and standing up for your community members, um, you're not doing your job. And so so it was a very, right. you know, I think it's one of the most rewarding positions you can have, but it's not for everybody because it can really take a special kind of talent to be able to to not only translate the information that's going back and forth, but also to have thick enough skin where you don't take things personally when a community member gets upset or the organization isn't giving you the support that you you think the community needs. So it sounds like there's there's some serious overlap with social media manager in a lot of ways, but it goes beyond that in that you're not limiting yourself to being on social media. You're involved in whatever the community yes. is involved. I, I always viewed this goes back like, you know, five, five, six years um, when I first started seeing social media managers they were typically either working for a brand or working for an agency handling the social media accounts for that company. So they were the ones right. managing Twitter, managing Facebook, you know, Instagram wasn't around then, Periscope, you know, Snapchat wasn't even around. So it was basically <laughs> they were managing the Twitter and the Facebook accounts for their, their brand or for an agency that was doing it for a brand. I think what happened was that marketing agencies started seeing that community manager came with a higher perceived value to the client. And so they started, now you go to a marketing agency, nobody calls them social media managers. They all call them community managers, even though they're doing the same exact thing right. that a social media manager did. But now the agency <laughs> is able to charge like $150 an hour instead of only $75 an hour. But I think right, there's right. a lot of differences. And, and I think social media manager is very focused and very limited. And, and there's a lot of different roles that a social media manager could play. But when you're a community manager, you don't even need to be on social media. When I was at Huffington Post, we actually, I was the community manager. And we had my counterpart was a social media marketing manager. And so he ran the social channels. I ran the, the commenters in the blogging community. And that's why you were so active under your own name 
Is that part of like a decision that some organizations make? Like you did all your tweeting as far as I could tell, or at least you were very active on Twitter at that time under your own account, a a corporate logo, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was myself before they hired me and they hired me as me. They didn't hire me to come in and become somebody else. So um, they knew what they were getting. They looked for that actually HuffPost Live looked for that and everybody that they hired um, producers, production assistants, hosts, anybody that they hired, they wanted people that understood how to use social. Some were a lot more active, but, um, but everybody right. needed to know how to use social media in order to reach out and find the type of guests that we wanted to get when we were launching. And, um, and so, you know, one of the reasons why I did that was because I didn't go on to the Huffington Post Twitter account. I didn't go, I was not an, an admin right. on the Huffington Post Facebook page. So everything for me, if I wanted to share what we were doing socially, it had to come from me because I didn't have access to be able to share it any other way. And so I did, I basically right. became kind of a brand ambassador for, you know, the organization when I was there. And I'm still very supportive of, of a lot of the work that they do and a lot of the, the initiatives that they're doing. Um, but but mo- most importantly is what I was able to bring to the organization, because what I had built before I started working there was when we were looking to get guests on, I would be able to reach out to my personal network and, and bring them into the HuffPost Live community as being on-air guests, as being people that, that could refer other people as people that would come in and comment on our segments. And so it was a two-way street where I was giving them my my community, right? My network of people. And I was also, you know, using my personal, um, you know, amplification or social channels to get people aware of what they were doing. Right, right. Um, we're talking with Tim McDonald and we'd love to take your questions. Uh, any questions you have about building community, uh, relationships, social good, Tim, is an expert he's not just playing an expert this is a real legitimate expert we have here today on ask the expert and uh, mitch jackson wants to join (laughs) us and we're going to give this a test you see how this i I don't know if you've seen me in the the top section yeah it's a little 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 narrow up there there. yeah (laughs) hey Hey, Hey, guys ducking down (laughs) yeah can you guys see me all right there you go go. now i can see you hey i have to say hello to tim and ross it's good to see you it's good to see you um you know i told ross tim early uh, ross i emailed you earlier today that when i found out you were going to be on tim i actually stayed in the office just to catch you on the show oh man but (laughs) but when when it when when we talk about community i mean tim's just a great example of of how your online community uh, works offline. And I do have a question, but let me just share a couple of quick stories with everybody. Tim and I met on Spreecast, what was that, Tim, 30, 40 years ago? Yeah, in, in <laughs> internet years, yes. <laughs> and, and we did the coffee time, and we've interviewed each other, and did some shows together, both as guests on shows. But he was nice enough to give my daughter a summer internship um, with HuffPost Live four or five years ago. And that really helped her with the jobs that she got while she was in college. But that offline relationship began with our online experiences, which was just awesome. And then over the years, I have had the chance to support each other at charitable causes uh, with uh, No Kid Hungry and some of the rotary things we're doing. So it's just really, really fun to see the online relationship that we've started transcend to our offline lives and experiences. It, it's amazing, isn't it? Tim? It's and and here's a fact: is Mitch and I have never actually met in person yet. But we feel like I mean, and I, 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 we haven't even discussed this, so I'm just throwing it out there. I know right. comfortable, you know. I know I would be comfortable enough if Mitch was in town for me to say, "Hey, come on over and stay at my house." And I know if I was in town, he'd, he, I could ask him, and he'd say, "Hey, come over and stay at my house." That's the Absolutely. kind of relationship we have because of. We we haven't been fake. Ross, you were talking in, you know, at the beginning about, you know, how so many people use social media as just, a, a, you know, a broadcast channel. And what makes it social is the interaction. And and I always used to use this example when I was in real estate and using Twitter. This is back in the early day. You know, if I ran into a neighbor at the grocery store, I wouldn't the first thing out of my mouth wouldn't be, hey, I got a listing that I think you're going to enjoy. It would be. <laughs> 
oh, I see you got steaks in there. Are you grilling out and going to invite me over? You know, that's the type, that's conversation. That's being social. And so we do it in person. Why are we changing ourselves when we get online? So you brought up a great point earlier and, right. and, and it just, it, it is so true that, that it's all the way that you yeah. use it is what you get out of it. Well, you, yeah, Mitch doesn't jump on and say, hey, do you need to sue anybody? Because I'm, <laughs> I, I've got an opening in my client sketch. Here we are thinking about charitable community service, and you bring up the S word. <laughs> but you know what's interesting is we were chatting on Spreecast, or maybe it was uh, on HuffPost Live. Tim had me on one of the shows, and uh, you were telling me, Tim was telling me about this group, this organization that, that's feeding children. And so we started this dialogue and I said, you know, I'm part of a group called Rotary. There's a connection here. We have to make this connection work. Fast forward, I don't know, what, two years, Tim? And all of a sudden, Jeff Daniels, uh, the, uh, the person representing No Kid Hungry at the time, I don't know if Jeff, or not Jeff Daniels, uh, was it Jeff Daniels? No, no, um, the dude. Uh, cover of Rotary Magazine. Yep. Uh, but but um, Bridges, yeah, Jeff Bridges. Bridges. I was drawing a blank there myself. I knew. <laughs> Jeff I knew. I knew it was, so yeah. all of a sudden, these two groups that we we're both involved with end up on the cover of one magazine, our Rotary International magazine, which is worldwide. And so we both knew we were on to something. And to see them come together, which had nothing to do with what Tim does or what I do for a living, but it has everything to do with connecting us as people. And that's my question. Here's my question. My question is with the. Uh, all the excitement floating around Pokemon Go, okay? With Nintendo increasing in wealth and market size by its share prices of about $13 billion over the last week or so. Understanding people are getting outside and interacting as a community, allegedly, and doing all kinds of fun things. How can we tap into that type of technology, Tim, uh, to build our community with a business twist. I mean, is there a, should business people be paying attention to what's happening with Pokemon Go? And do you see that as part of building a business community, uh, you know, in the upcoming years? Well, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, this is a great example of, of what Pokemon Go is doing. It's bringing people out into the world, right? And it's allowing you to give them a reason, if they're actively playing this game, to come and visit your place of business. And so if you can get them in the door and you give them incentives to be there, all of a sudden you're bringing in people that never even probably knew that you existed before. And so it's a great way. But I don't want, you know, I mean, for a business that's not active on social, I think just trying to jump on, on a bandwagon of something that that's, you know, that's kept on, on fire right now, you know, and, and growing faster than than Snapchat is in, in much less time um, is right. is to think about, you know, if you have a Facebook page and a customer asks a question on there, why aren't you responding to them? You know, that's like the type of thing that we need to be social for. And if somebody checks in on, on Instagram and of a picture of your, your business or one of your products, or if, they, if they're checking in on Foursquare or they're checking in on Facebook, are you actively in real time monitoring that so you can actually thank that person when they're in your store instead of just doing it online? Imagine the power and, and the, 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 you know, the absolute connection that you're going to make with that person when you, they actually know that you're paying attention to what they're doing online when they're actually there in your physical space. There is so much opportunity here that is not hard, it's not difficult, and it's accessible for all of us to be able to take advantage of. It's just taking the time to actually do it is what's going to make the difference and make you stand out and get more business. I, uh, I wrote a post on Medium earlier today talking about two important business assets, and that being time and attention, how important those two assets are both to us as entrepreneurs and business owners and to our clients and customers. And how I feel Pokemon Go is really just sucking up everyone's time, attention, and energy because most people aren't using it the right way. Um, having said that, do you feel that uh, if you're a, uh, a business on the corner and should you be spending your marketing dollars now uh, embracing the Pokemon.go technology where I guess you can buy something that gets people over to your business. I forgot what it's called. Or should you be using those marketing dollars 
for other existing platforms, other well-tested business marketing tools, instead of jumping on the Pokemon.go uh, bandwagon at this time. Right. That's kind of where my mind's yeah. at. I just don't see- Yeah, no, this is this is perfect because I kind of use this analogy with, I mean, but but the way you framed it in this situation is exactly the way that I, I talk about this all the time. It's a difference between you know, using like an influencer and, and we've seen this for years, right? When on television and radio where there'd be a celebrity influencer who'd come in and you pay that person to talk about your brand, you get an immediate spike, right? But then what happens after that? It goes right back down and you're right at the same levels that you were at before. Mm -hmm. So if you want to put your marketing dollars into Pokemon Go, I'm sure you're going to see a spike. But then as soon as the fad's over, and I do think, I don't think augmented reality is a fad. I think the Pokemon right. Go is going to become a fad. And and what what all you're going to do is see that spike and then it's going to drop back down. Now, if you start putting your dollars into something that's going to help you grow and build relationships over time, it's going to take a little bit longer to get there. But what you're going to see is over time, that's going to grow and it's going to increase and it's going to keep growing. And so, so what I always look at is I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong. Just know what you're trying to get out of it and the long and short term impact that those dollars are going to have because they're giving you two very different results not one is better than another it's just what are your needs right now well i know if i was in the parent parachute industry right now we just had a couple of knuckleheads here in california walk off a cliff while playing pokemon go i just posted that, that on twitter <laughs> that would have been a great byline you know if they had been using my shoots oh, at the time they were diving into the Pacific Ocean, everything would be okay. <laughs> I think they're both okay, but, you know, unbelievable. Um, but I just wanted to hop on and say hi and say hi to No, thank you. Guys. Great to see you. And actually kick the tires on Fire Talk, too. Yeah, so. yeah, I'm, I'm doing the same thing here. <laughs> All right, well, listen, Tim, don't be a stranger, and Ross, we'll see you on your next show, okay? okay take care, Mitch. Right, Thanks, guys. Mitch. A great one. Hey, so... I'm thinking I don't have to spend time learning about Pokemon Go then. <laughs> I, even, I just know enough think, about it. And and my brother posted something this morning that he must be the only person not playing it because his wife wife was actually <laughs> taking a picture of of him and with a Pokemon in there. So, you know, um, and, and I said, you know, back in the early days of Yelp, Yelp actually had some Easter egg augmented reality things where you could hold your phone up over a business and it would show you like a, a review or, or the, the, the thing about the, you know, the business if they were listed on Yelp. And so all you need to do is hold your phone and, and it would pick up where you were and, and be able to do that, which is very much like the premise of what Pokemon Go is. And this augmented reality thing is going to be, I think, pretty huge, but I have not I have not even downloaded the game. I haven't read about any of these things. I just see the headlines and everybody, you know, all all the people involved in content marketing are writing about Pokemon Go now because that's what everybody's searching for. So it's like I, I get I can't miss it in my feed on Facebook. It's like all over the place. But I really have not. That's not why the buzz of these yet. things is bigger than than the thing actually well, is, this right? Is, because this is everybody wants to catch. <laughs> this is this is actually as big as the buzz then. <laughs> So, uh, you know, if if somebody is is starting out in building community, right there, they can be overwhelmed by how many tools there are. Right. And it's not about the tools. It's about relationships. But the tools help you build and maintain those relationships. Right. So it can be anything from website to email to live streaming to social media to events to in-person uh events virtual events um games contests giveaways whatever where where is a business that that hasn't really thought much about community they just think about sales and they're doing okay and now they realize they need to build the next generation of customers and really engage those people and and make sure that their business sustains itself and grows. Where do they start? <laughs> well, I think the first thing is that most people don't is identify what what that generation of customers looks like, right? Like who are they? Mm -hmm. And where are they spending their time? And what trends have you seen with where they've been, where they're at and where where it's projected that they're going to be? Because if if I'm a business that's selling to people that that are retired, my my 
future next generation of customers isn't going to be the millennials that are on Snapchat, right? <laughs> it's going to be, it's right, going to be right. the people in their 50s that are getting and 60s that are getting ready to retire in, in the next five to 10 years. And so, so I really think that's the first step is really understand and don't think it's, it's that next generation of customers is going to look just like your existing generation of customers because they're going to be different. We all are different. And, and so really understanding that and then start identifying, you know, there's two things that I would identify is one, where are the people that I want to connect with already spending their time? And two, after I ask that question, if it's because chances are it's going to be in multiple places, where do I feel comfortable spending my time and learning about? And don't, you know, this right. is the biggest mistake I think most businesses get in and then they throw the towel in and say, this didn't work. Focus on one thing. Don't try and, and get on 10 different platforms at one time. Focus on one, get good at it, and then build the relationships there. You'll be, you'll, if you build your community right, you're going to have people that will help you on those other platforms that they're active on, so you don't need to become the expert at it. Let your community be right. your best fan and, and go out and talk about you. Hey, Nick. Nick had a great comment uh, about Pokemon Go, and I figured, why don't you just hop on and... and get in the discussion yeah, i love it how you doing Nick? Yeah, you. Live, it on there. yeah i do have it on today uh yeah you know i i i don't disagree with mitch uh, i i tend not to i i i like a lot of what he has to say almost most of what he has to say and i do feel like the pokemon go itself might be a waste of time i don't disagree with that but i my thought was the reason i'm playing with it and, and getting the experience just with this and, and i can't say that i'm playing with it a significant amount of time but i think the next iteration of this augmented reality uh, or or a couple of iterations down the road we're going to see some some real advances and and some real value for a business it is not going to affect our business the experts.com business is just not going to uh, but my cousin who owns a convenience store he may find some value in bringing in this type of foot traffic Absolutely agree with that. It's uh, it's all about the type of business, the type of uh, you know, do you, you know, if you're online, I mean, who's gonna you know? <laughs> it's not gonna bring anybody in. Yeah, it's for not me. gonna bring anybody in. <laughs> no, but but if he can if he can spend a few bucks a day and sell some candy bars and sodas, some more can candy bars and sodas, then I think there might be some value there for him. And and think about this, right? Especially like in a local business like that. Imagine he's one of the first ones doing that and the local news catches on to it. And now he's on the on the local news where where even more people are learning about his business. That's like earned media, which is the best kind of advertising because it's more trusted than when you actually pay for advertising. So That's right. There could be a lot of benefits for businesses right. that get into it early that are right. the local brick and mortar type of stores. Yeah, yeah, and that that's where I see it. If you could if you could actually show, all right, well I spent 50 bucks, but I got 20 or 30 people in to buy 99 cents, dollar 29, something like that. Then and somebody actually paid attention that that they were doing it this way, uh that he was getting some some foot traffic that way and he's already got a ton of foot traffic so maybe he's not the best example but somebody who maybe is new just a small restaurant on what we call the miracle mile uh that's a new place and they're trying to get some awareness that they're then it might be good but it you know for for an online business or pro, even for professional services because i've heard some other professional services dental office and so forth trying to use it like that are you really going to get the type of traffic that you want? Is somebody going to get or there and say, just gonna, I got to get everybody my... in your waiting room, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're just going to fill up a, a small waiting yeah, room with non paying customers. All of a sudden, you... unless they got a cavity on the <laughs> way mean, over. Last right? time you walked past the dentist's <laughs> office and said, I got to go in there right now, you know, it's just. <laughs> so, anyway, those were my two cents. And, and the impulse, An impulse buy for buy. the, for the cleaning. Yeah. <laughs> Like so a, those uh, are my two cents on it. I'm just only playing with it for to to see how it interacts and see uh, be up to date on where AR is going. 
Yeah, and Tracy just said said uh, her son walked two miles, uh, bought fifteen dollars at one store, and walked back, and then stopped at another store and bought stuff. So I mean, there's there's an actual case example of there of, it is you know, Pokemon Go turning into dollars at a business. That, yep, that's exactly right. So uh, it not for me, and and I noticed when I got in bed last night at, <laughs> at about eight thirty, uh, and I laid and I was I turned it on, and I was like, well, I've heard of people saying i'm going out to the park to catch a pokemon i'm not not i'm now i'm i'm laying down it's not going to be me but <laughs> a 15 year old may do just that so he's oh, 25 tracy says you know? <laughs> well see here, here here's what pokemon too old. Old. When my kids were young is we had to keep going to the store and buying more packs of cards so that they could find the right card so when they were playing with their friends with the card game that they actually had the right right number of points and could do all the trading and everything. So right, uh, right. you know, I mean, it's it's the same thing. It's just the technology's changed. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's just changed. Anyway, I want to thank you guys. Yeah, we yeah. did it with baseball. <laughs> yeah, cards. we did baseball cards. <laughs> And they'd always put the same, like, you know, minor players in the uh, in the pack and you get like occasionally get a good one and you get excited. It's like gambling, right? You, you, you hit the slot machine early and you think, OK, I can do this all day. I'm going to keep feeding it. And then you go back and buy another pack and another pack. And it's like, no, nah, not 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 getting any. That's superstars right. In here. That's right. Anyway, guys, thank you very much. Great. Always a good show, Ross. Tim, good to see you. Hey, good seeing you, Nick. Thanks for stopping. In. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks a lot, Nick. So yeah, um, it's funny. It, it, like the more things change, the more they they really stay the same. They're just building. They're just using new technology to rework the same concepts, well, I, aren't I, they? I mean, people have been relating to each other and telling stories and competing and sharing and helping for thousands and thousands of years. It's just we we now have this thing too. Well, you know, and and sometimes <laughs> we can learn a lot from really looking back in time right i mean i had a good friend of mine jeff power today's his birthday actually hey jeff happy birthday um he he works for global hope network international and he also owns uh pangeo coffee and when i was talking to him about communities he works with a lot of um, villages over in ethiopia and he said community over in these villages isn't a matter of of just advancing it's a matter of survival because if not everybody in the community looks out for everybody else in the community, the community will perish. And I think if we stopped, you know, and really started thinking about how, what's going on, especially in the US right now, right? And, and in the world. And if we started looking at everybody in our community as a valuable asset to the community, instead of looking at what's wrong with them, and how they could be, how they should be acting, or what they should be saying, or what actions they should be doing. All of a sudden, we can go from actually being this, this you know, divisive and and you know, conflicting community into a very thriving community because we're all looking out for our our survival and our success instead of trying to take each other down. And, you know, it was just such a powerful little statement that he told me about, you know, it wasn't a matter of of just trying to thrive. It was a matter of th survival. And that's why they actually have to look at, after each other and make sure that everybody's contributing to the society and the community. And that's what I think we need to be looking at when we build communities is how can we get everybody and make sure that everybody has what they need in order to be able to be successful and be able to contribute fully to the success of the community. And I think that's why um, No Kid Hungry was such a powerful campaign that you had been working on, because it starts with making sure that our most vulnerable, our, our, our children, at least have enough food to sustain them to get through a day at school, to learn, to grow, to remain healthy. And I mean, you really took that in, in, into being like a prominent when I think of what some of the you know big online campaigns are. That's one that's really sustained itself. And and people, I mean, it, it's the campaign was beautiful visually, right? Like it had a very strong visual identity. You know, when you see a, a no kid hungry post, it 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 brought the children to life. It just was really well done. Can you distill a little bit about 
how you made that how you made that work and why that campaign is one that's so memorable um because gosh there's so many organizations that are doing good things and there's so many interesting campaigns but that one really amongst people online i think well i think has you know out. i mean and and thank you for for all those kind words ross i mean i was certainly just a, a part of of a much bigger you know organization that that's doing this work and still doing this work um because you know in america we have you know one in five children face hunger and security every day. And that's, you know, one in 16 million kids or 16 million kids in the US, which is just, it's it's really, there's no need for it because there's a solution to it, right? We know the solution, we just need to get it implemented. And, and you know, part of, I think, why it's so successful is this is something that I don't think you're gonna get anybody that's gonna argue with it, right? I mean, nobody's gonna say, oh, no, we shouldn't feed the kids. Now you will get you will get arguments that say, right. "Oh, it's the parents' fault. Obesity is a bigger problem than than hunger." You know, I mean, you get those kind of things, and and those are all. I mean, it's all related, right? It all comes into the same thing. But I think really what makes No Kid Hungry so successful is it's the name of the parent organization, the nonprofit. It's called Share Our Strength, and what they believe is everybody mm-hmm. has a strength to share. And so one of the things that made it so easy to work with them is if you came in and said you didn't have money and you were a blogger, we'd say, we have a blogging program. Would you like to blog with us? If, if you didn't write and, and you had money and you wanted to work that way, we'd say, just, just make a donation and get involved that way. If you were passionate about cooking, you could host a bake sale and, and raise money that way. Or you could host a Cooking Matters course in your local community and teach parents and students how to cook healthy meals on a budget with foods that are local to the area that they live in. And so it was just, it's all these different facets that, you know, there were so many different ways to get involved with No Kid Hungry. And they didn't go out to the, to the, to the public and say, here's how we need your help. It's like, you know, let's, if you, let's make you aware of No Kid Hungry. Once you're aware of No Kid Hungry, let's listen to what you're saying. Let's listen to the things that you're doing. Let's, let's pay attention to who you are and what your bio is, and then figure out what programs we have that you might be interested in sharing your strength with us. And that's really how we grew is not by the organization doing something, but it's something about just listening to each individual and what their strength was and then saying, how can we help you use your strength to really help end childhood hunger here in America? And that's what we still do today. And, and what's great about it is now some of the people that I was involved with when I first got involved with the organization three years ago are now actually the, doing the same thing I did when I, you know, three years ago, when I was the one going out and just being like the, the, the ambassador and spreading the message and getting other people aware of it. Now they're actually going out and getting people aware of it and bringing more people in there that are taking even more actions that are having even a greater impact. And so it's just, it's so exciting to see so many people in the community getting involved in an organization that lets them have the tools, have the support and have the, the flexibility and the freedom to go out and make the impact in their own way using their own strength. You know, and I like the other thing I like because on social media, since the day that I joined Facebook, I've held true to this, that I'm not going to share or discuss politics. Everybody is open to doing on friends. Somebody, I think for speech is wonderful. I just don't think it's the place where I want to engage in, in, in that. Right. So no kid. What, what I love about no kid hungry is that it is it is not political it's it's a it's it's a cause like you had mentioned that no matter what your political views are on the major issues of the day there is a way you can support this mission you can get involved with it without having to say i'm on this side i'm on the red team i'm on the blue team i'm on this this team i'm on that team i'm against them there the really isn't in the way that it's marketed any idea of of where somebody's political alliances come from, what side they're on, who they're for, who they're against. They're for the children. They're for making sure that people get a good meal when they go to school. And, and there's ways that you, you, you know, there's, there's, gov- there's steps government can take there's steps, you know, nonprofits can take the steps that individuals can take in their communities, volunteering, 
um, like you said, money. It could be lending a hand. It could be using your skills in a way. So it, it really doesn't require you to sign on to something and say, OK, I'm with this candidate who's leading this cause. It's it, it really is something that, that is, is unifying. It's not just um, saying like, OK, we're going to we're going to have this cause and either you're with us or again, everybody can be with that cause, regardless of how they would approach an issue from a, a political, social point of view. Well, and it's very intentional. I mean, all the bills that that they come out with statements on and support revolving around hunger and, and spending and and, you know, and different different aspects that that affect these programs is it's a very nonpartisan, you know, approach. And it's very much a thing that even though it might benefit what No Kid Hungary's goals are, if it hurts maybe another, you know, hunger, you know, aspect that that's outside of the children, they don't want to come out and support it, you know, so they'll just stay neutral on it because they don't want to impact any organization or any efforts that are being made towards ending hunger, even though their mission is childhood hunger. And so it very gets into this, this right. it's a nonpartisan thing. Um, actually, last summer when they, they had started, um, with, you know, renewing the, the, the summer meals act, or it's a big spending bill, but it, it was, it was huge. It, but a big part of it was we were pushing for changes in the summer meal programs because all the kids that rely on school breakfast and school lunches during the summertime don't have access to those programs. And so right. um, some of the laws that have been in existence have been in place for 40 years, which doesn't give local municipalities and states the ability to figure out what's going to work in their communities. And so we were pushing for that. And right before, I mean, it got, it went through many different variations and, and morphed many different times, but the initial act and, and bill that they were putting out on the floor was co-sponsored, I think by 26 of, of, you know, representatives. And it was almost exactly half and half between Democrats and Republicans. So that just goes to show you that this is not a, an issue that that's, you know, divisive dem, down party lines. This is something that that is a human, you know, a, a human element that we just need to treat other people and especially the next generation, our, our youth, you know, give them a chance to just have a healthy life. And if we look at, at what kids that are getting fed do, they graduate school at a higher rate. You know, they're healthier, they're more employable, they're less likely to end up in the criminal justice system. So there's so many positives that come from just making sure that our kids are fed while they're going to school that we can point to, but we can't start pointing to that until we start addressing the problem that's at hand, which is how do we make sure every kid gets us a meal every day? You know, that's what we need to get to right now. We're seeing major strides um, in a lot of different states. Um, Arkansas and Maryland are two states that have made, you know, tremendous strides and almost have it where, you know, they've, they've you know, gotten to a place where they've proven the model works. And now we can start bringing that to other states and other municipalities. So it's it's very exciting on what we can do. And Mitch, thanks for putting the website out there, the nokidhungry.org. I think, you know, this is the one thing I tell everybody is if, you know, if you're asking yourself, how do I get involved in No Kid Hungry? How do I, you know, what do you want me to do, Tim, you know, to help out with No Kid Hungry? All I'm going to ask you to do is go to nokidhungry.org and just put in your email. Take the They call it take the pledge. Just put in your email address and sign up to get their emails because there's so, like I mentioned earlier, there's so many different ways to get involved. Start reading what they send you and see what resonates with you and then learn more about that. And if that sounds like something you want to get involved with, just click to learn more and, and get involved and, and take the action that you want to take. And that's the only thing that I would ask you right now, though, is just go to the site, nokidhungry.org, sign up with your email, and just take the time to learn about the different ways that you can get involved and some of the different ways that No Kid Hungry is making an impact here in the U.S. That's awesome. And in the in the last couple of minutes that, that we have left, since we have a lot of hardcore live streaming uh, folks and fans of live streaming, talk a little bit about how you see that live streamers, people who are hosting shows, whether really whether it's a live show, it's a podcast, but doing some type of Internet broadcasting, how they can build community either around their business, their brand through engaging those folks who enjoy listening to and participating in their their live yeah broadcasts. well i think you know the the number one thing that you can do is 
you know, and I've always said this, when you build a community, especially when you're starting out, it, you know, don't feel like you have to start from scratch because there's so many other existing communities out there that you can go. And that doesn't mean that you can just go to another community and say, hey, come be part of my community. But if you actually get involved in that community, you know, let get people get to know who you are. And then when they know that you're you're doing your your live stream, you're going to get a few of them that come over. And some of those people that come over will become part of your community that you're building. And if you do that with enough communities, you don't have to start from scratch because you're basically just bringing in people from other communities. And and so that's number one. I think the, the second thing that, that most people don't take the time to do is they focus too much like on the guests that they're asking to come on, right? Like that's who they want. <laughs> they want the big name. They want the people that's got a lot of followers to come in. And, and that's only part of it because it's what you do after that person's there. And you do this so well, Ross, you, you get, you talk to everybody in the comments, you let them know that they're, you know, that they're there, you respond to them, you acknowledge them. And I know this about you, you don't just do it while we're on air, you actually keep the conversation going, you go check out some of their shows when they're doing them. And that's you building your community, right? That's you taking the time to get to know who these people are and caring about them just as much as what you care about your what you're doing and and i think somebody actually said this uh sheree was in here earlier i don't know if she's still here but she you know she said something about you know hey um you know it's it's about giving and not taking right and and i view you know what most people do when we get on social media is we become a bulldozer you know we push a message out and 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 you know we don't care right we don't care you know, we don't think about it, but we really don't care because we don't, we're not paying attention to how we're making people feel. We don't care about, you know, who we're, who we're alienating. All we're doing is caring about, let's get our message out. And what I say you need to do is you need to start becoming the magnet and you need to start attracting people into you. But once they're attracted into you, how do you get them to stick around, right? How do you get them to want to stay and become part of your community? So that's the second thing is, is, you know, it's like, you know, first is, is go out to other communities and try and get people in. The second is, you know, build the relationships with people that are in here. And, and the third thing is, once you have people in your community and you get to know who they are, give them some power, you know, give them some, some flexibility. Don't feel like you're doing all this alone. Let see what they're doing, what's working for them, ask them if it's working, if they want to take on a bigger role in helping you. And I mean, with my community manager, that's how that started. I started out with, with just me and I asked one other person to help me. We did a couple of things. I, I'd asked Brandy McCollum. She was helping me for a long time with our first community manager unconference and, and, you know, and, and getting the Twitter chat going on, on community manager hangout. And then, you know, then it got to a point where we were doing like, the, the hangouts and the the Twitter feed and and doing so much of this. And it was like, I mean, it was overwhelming to me. And and Sherry Rohde was on and and I asked her if she wanted to get involved in and Sherry actually runs my community manager now with 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 Jonathan Brewer, you know, Brew. And so it was like I just got to know them. They got involved in it. And after a while I just got to a point where I said, you know what? I I feel good about where this is at. Are you guys interested in just carrying the torch and keeping it going? And they were like, yeah. And I'm like, fantastic, have at it. And I just gave it to them and let them go. So that was, that's like, as a community manager, that's the proudest moment that you can have is that when you help grow a community and then you can actually walk away and let your community members continue to run it. And it yep. continues to sustain itself and even even continue to, to, to grow. Um, we talked a lot about what you've done in the past. Tell everybody what you're what you're working on oh. right now. <laughs> I, I do a lot of different things. I actually just labeled myself on on LinkedIn as a generalist because I, I get tired of people I tired that. of people saying, what do you do? Because I'm much more complex than that. I'm a human being with a heart and I, I really feel like I'm I have depths on many different levels. But really what I'm excited about is um, with my partner Ayelet Baron, who's out in the San Francisco area, is we're starting up um, life working. And it's really talking about, um, you know, how we start living one life um, where work is just part of it. And, you know, as part of this whole whole essence, we're really trying to help people feel like when they want to create the change they want to see in the world, that they don't have to feel like they're alone. You know, we can't take the steps for them, but we can hold their hand as they're taking those steps. 
And so we're bringing in and building a community of people that are really going to be 21st century leaders and really just just you know bust this this myth of work life balance and and really understand that it really is life working. And she's got a book coming out. We got a, a podcast that we're going to be starting soon. We have an assessment tool for people to help guide you and and where you're at on your journey. So we got a lot of stuff happening. Um, it's all been in the works for over a year now, but it's all going to start coming out in the next couple of months. So I'm really excited to uh, to share that with the world very soon. That's terrific. Well, if you're a part of it, it's it's definitely going to be useful to a lot of people and, and helpful to a lot of people. So um, I'm so glad that you joined me tonight. Um, this was fun. This is just part one. I can't wait to have you back on in December. We'll talk more about broadcasting and the social media aspects of live streaming and, and, and what you've been doing uh, there as well. But um, this was so much fun. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, on Twitter at T.A. McDonald. McDonald on Twitter and Tim A. McDonald on uh, Instagram and uh, and Snapchat. Sounds good. Uh, I'm going to head over to uh, BTS Live for uh, Marty McPadden and Mark Rogers talking about broadcasting over there. And then I'd love it if everybody came back and joined me here Monday night. Vincent Orlick, you know him from the Blabaholics Facebook group. He'll be my guest at 7 p.m. Eastern. Have a great night, everybody.